well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming in today. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm the museum coordinator here at the Yorkshire Natural History Museum. Uh, and today we're going to have a, a brief rollover of the formation of Earth, our very own planet, and currently the only confirmed life-bearing planet in the universe. So this won't be going massively into detail, but just a quick run over of the conditions necessary to form life as we know it, and the current search for any Earth-like planets that, are, that is undergoing so far. So first of all, just a little bit about our very own uh, small blue dot. So Earth is the only planet known to currently support complex life or indeed any life at all. We do theorize that there is uh, microbial life potentially within our own solar system in the oceans of Europa and other planets. Uh, but currently we have no definitive proof. It's only theories. So currently we're the only confirmed living planet to ever exist. Uh, so we are probably because, because uh, we're the only ones we have life because we are the only planet to have sustained stable bodies of water on the surface that are not under thick sheets of ice and have not evaporated away. Uh, we're not the only planet to have ever had water. It has been confirmed that water has indeed existed on Mars in the form of oceans and ice caps. And it is theorized there was, of course, water on Venus and Mercury as well. But due to their positions too close to the sun, those oceans have since boiled away, leaving us as the only planet with any oceans currently on the surface, a whopping 70 percent coverage as well. So there's plenty of water on Earth. And last but not least, one thing that must be kept in mind for Earth as well, for our size, we have quite high tectonic activity, which is very unusual in rocky planets. So I will get back to that in just a second. That's something else to keep in mind as a condition for life on Earth. So we have a brief rollover of how old Earth actually is. So Earth is 4.6 billion years old, which is an enormous number to try and wrap your head around. Uh, it's roughly the same age as the birth of our star, because material would have been coalescing around the newborn star and then colliding with each other to form the rocky planets near the Earth's centre and the gas giants further out into its orbit. Um, you can find maps that have the size of the different eons and periods uh, relevant to how long it took. This is not one of them, simply because it wouldn't fit on the actual display. Uh, but there's only been 12% of Earth's actual lifespan, the Phanozoic eon, the eon of life, actually contains you know, anything living at all. The vast majority of Earth's lifespan is actually in the Precambrian on the majority <laughs> is in, in the Protozoic period. So the Hadean is what you would see as Earth initially forming. Many rocks collide together, literally a ball of hot lava, not much else going on at this point in time. As we cool into the Archean period, we get a lot of uh, bombardment from meteorites. We theorize this is where Earth's water actually comes from, water and ice from meteorites hitting Earth, evaporating, and then condensing into our atmosphere over millions and millions of years, a very slow process. And then getting how long into the Protozoic, we've finally got stable tectonic activity. We're no longer a ball of boiling rock, which is great for life, because we theorize this is when microbial life would have started somewhere in this point just here. We know we can find uh, evidence for microbials uh, all the way back in the Cryogenian period, 700 million years ago during Earth's ice ball stage, where it was literally snowball Earth. There was only a thin band around the equator that was even remotely melted enough to allow life to exist. We know there was bacteria at that point in time from the fossils we find in Antarctica. So we're thinking single cellular, uh, uncomplex life in the later part of the Protozoic and then complex life kicking off in the Cambrian explosion into what we see today. Now, going right to the beginning, uh, there is theorizing that the age of the universe has been considered to be 13.7 billion years old for a very, very long time. Welcome, guys. Come on in. We've got space at the front just here. Now, we, the way we measured this is by uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, literally the aftermath of the Big Bang. It's one of the only aftermath effects we actually have that we can measure. And we also measure this by the rate of redshift in the, in the observable galaxies and stars we can see. So how we're doing it is our telescopes are focusing on the darkest parts of the night sky and measuring the change in light as it reaches us. Red is the very end of the light spectrum. It slows down and we can see the rate of travel away from us. From that, we can calculate the rate of movement and how long it must have taken to go from one point to where it is now. So 13.7 billion years is the agreed upon age of the universe. However. There has been new research from the University of Ottawa that potentially the universe might actually be 26 billion years old. There's always going to be fluctuation. It's currently a 
it's being fought to be proven, I should say. Uh, so what, what's happened is the new James Webb telescope has actually found galaxies in the darkest part of the sky that currently we were unable to see prior to this point. Naturally, these galaxies we would expect with the rate of light shift, as we know, is the further back we can see, the further back in time we're technically looking due to the rate of light speed. We would assume if these are older galaxies, they would be seeing them as only half formed or in their early stages. They wouldn't be that now, but we could only see that through our telescopes at this distance as being early formed. However, the galaxies we saw were mature galaxies. They had plenty of stars of their own. They'd been spinning for a long, long time which means that clearly the universe must have been even older than we initially expected. So that's still being thought to be proven. I believe it's Rajendra Gupta of the University of Ottawa that's actually done that research. Uh, but very exciting stuff to think the universe is twice as old as we initially expected. But we get to our star. So our star is roughly 5.5 to 5.6 billion years old. Uh, it's roughly halfway through its life cycle. It's a mature star. It's got about 5 billion years left before it goes into the next stage of its life cycle, which is a red giant, in which case it would grow to several times its current size, swallow Venus and Mercury, and just about stop short of Earth, but it would be incinerated by that point anyway. So it is a yellow dwarf star, a very common type of star in the galaxy. It's not certainly not the largest or the strongest type of star, but it uh, operates at 15 million degrees centigrade at its core or Celsius, I should say, rather, and operates 93 million miles from Earth, which places us smack in the middle of something called the habitable zone. So one of the key components of life is it can't be too cold, and it certainly can't be too hot. So Venus and Mercury never would have had a chance because if you're looking at the circumstellar habitable zone here of our star in the middle, what you're seeing is our star, and it's simply too hot for water to stay at a consistent temperature on the surface of the planet, the seas boil away. If there's no water, currently we have no evidence of life. So Venus and Mercury are simply too hot to function. Earth operates here in the middle of the habitable zone. It's a perfect distance, not too hot, not too cold. Mars sits just on the edge out into the colder regions of space and past that it's too cold, ice freezes. And ego, no life, there's no liquid water per our current understanding of life. Um, this will vary depending on different stars. Colder stars and smaller stars like red dwarfs are going to have their habitable zone be closer toward them, simply because they're not outputting as much heat as the yellow dwarfs, whereas much hotter stars up here are going to have their habitable zone be further away. So it very much depends on each individual solar system and the orbit of each star as to whether we can find another planet with similar conditions, Earth-like conditions, as ours, since we only have ourselves to go off at this point. Now, one of the major components of life being able to form on Earth is the fact we are not actually bombarded on the regular anymore by interstellar debris. Now, of course, we have been bombarded in the past. Anyone who's ever seen Jurassic Park is going to know that there was a meteorite that struck Earth and ended the dinosaurs. This is a shockingly rare phenomenon nowadays compared to the rate of bombardment on other planets. And the cause of that is actually Jupiter within our own solar system. So Jupiter, the largest gas giant we have, absolutely enormous. Earth fits very snugly within its red dot there, as a size comparison for you. Now, Jupiter's gravity is absolutely immense. It actually forms a counterweight within our own solar system to the sun. Each planet, of course, has its own gravitational pull, but Jupiter's extends very far out past its initial moons. So what Jupiter is essentially doing is any debris coming into our solar system is going to get caught in Jupiter's gravitational well and be pulled towards it rather than toward the core rocky planets at the center of the solar system. Meaning that uh, basically, unless you are in very unlucky positions, i.e. it comes in at a point where Jupiter is further away from Earth and just manages to skip past the orbit, it's very unlikely for anything to come and strike us or anything in the middle anymore. So three cheers for planetary Jupiter, absolutely, keeping us safe all that time. Uh, Jupiter has 90, 95, I think, yeah, 95 moons currently. That's how strong its gravity actually is. And uh, if you were to send anything to Jupiter, it's going to be crushed without, without a doubt. I believe this at the Galileo probe, actually, uh, on my birthday, as it would turn out, uh, to go and get pictures of Jupiter. And as soon as it entered the upper reaches of the atmosphere, it was crushed flat. Now, the reason it's crushing flat is because mass and size absolutely matter in space. So mass is simply the matter of an object. Uh, size is indicated by how densely it is packed together. So you imagine 
a, you imagine a steel ball and a sponge. Both of them could have the same mass, but the steel ball being packed much denser is a heavier, smaller object, whereas the sponge is less dense, is lighter in area, and has a larger mass to take it up. So uh, this is getting into physics, which I'm not an expert in, so <laughs> forgive me any inconsistencies. But basically, smaller planetary bodies having less mass and therefore less gravity have a smaller gravitational pull and therefore need a balancing point for life to form on them. Jupiter, even if it were solid, would be simply too large as gravity is too strong and life could not physically stand up. It could not resist the gravitational force of its own planet. If anyone's ever been on a roller coaster and not locked their arms, they know what the feeling is like. So you need to be a certain size to have a nice band of gravity that isn't going to crush you and you're also not going to jump and fly away at any point. So again, life has got to be at a habitable distance from the sun, orbiting a star that is neither hot, too hot nor too cold. And it has to be having a certain size and a certain gravity threshold for life. Is everyone following me so far? Yeah, brilliant. All right, then. There's another, another example of gravitational force. So the way I, I, I like to measure it is basically, uh, or imagine it rather, uh, if you're imagining space and time not to be nothingness, but more like, more like a, a jelly almost, you can see the weight of things being pulled in sort of like balls on a net. That's how gravity is formed. Something can be sliding past you and it'll be, you have the gravity nets of a planet dipping in like this. It will then be caught in the gravity well due to its own momentum and start spinning it around. That's an easy way to picture time, space and gravity in that sort of manner. The greater your speed, the more chance you have to escape a gravity well and go. However, the slower your speed, the more easily you're probably going to be pulled in. So it's a matter of uh, forces, which is something to keep in mind, especially considering that our own solar system is not a static place. It is constantly moving because we have our very own galactic orbit to think of. So we have actually spinning around the centre of our own galaxy, which in of itself is now moving millions and millions of light years per, se per second through the void of the universe. So you imagine how long it takes for the uh, solar system to orbit the centre of our galaxy once. It takes 225 million years. So in our well, in the period of life, the Phanozoic, we've done two galactic orbits, we're about halfway through the third one. In ter talking in terms of the birth of Earth itself, 4.6 billion years, we've only gone around the centre of our galaxy 20 times. So it's a bonkers length of time and a bonkers distance, especially considering we're in the outer reaches of our very own galaxy. The Milky Way is right in the outer arm, and that is now spinning the entire way around it. Obviously, stars will have a much shorter, uh, shorter galactic year closer to the centre of the, of the galaxy. All right, so keep in mind our moon as our neighbour. So this is probably the single greatest cause of life to actually happening on Earth, which you don't expect when you look up as our moon in the night sky. So what the moon is actually doing is the moon is acting as a counterweight to Earth's own gravity. So as we spin, we're generating movement and force among the liquid surfaces of our planet, which of course is our oceans. We know the moon controls our tides. It also controls our weather patterns because it's pulling on Earth as itself. Air is splitting across the desert, tropical and temperate zones to form bands across the Earth, which we know as the jet stream. So the faster Earth spins, you know, the more violent the weather becomes. The moon sort of counteracts that and keeps it at a steady pace the entire way around. Uh, if we did not have the moon, the tide would actually be running up about maybe 200 metres every time higher than it currently is, which would be very violent and not a great place for life to be evolving in. So that stabilising influence of our single planetary satellite is something that's really essential for life to be forming. We know the moon was closer to Earth at what, uh, back in its ancient past when it first formed, and that would have had an effect on the tides as well. I will just get to that in just a moment here. Yes. So we have our Earth just about here, looking very blue and beautiful and lovely as it does. We have our moon next to it, appropriately scaled, much smaller than you think it is when you look at it. And yet, when you look at the scale of Earth and the scale of our moon, these are the moons of Uranus and Saturn, just here. Uh, we all know Uranus and Saturn are gas giants. They're many, many times the size of Earth. And yet, these are their moons to scale with ours. Their moons are tiny. They're absolutely tiny. And why would you think a bigger planet would have a bigger moon as well as more of them? But that is not the case in this instance. Earth's moon is actually much larger compared to us than any other satellite currently operating in our current solar system. Why on Earth would that be? Why on Earth is that happening? 
And that is because we had a sister back in our early evolution. So way back when, 4.5 billion years ago, the sun has just formed. There's many, many more planetoids, baby planets, uh, debris, in the, debris in the solar system than there currently is now. And being that thing, things are all spinning around and smacking into each other, there's a lot of collisions happening in our early solar system too. Now, give it a few billion years, we start to find large bodies coalescing, especially in the rocky areas of our solar system. And we have, we're finding that simply due to coincidence, we're finding large bodies are forced to share the same place. And then by that point, it's only a matter of time before a collision occurs. So Thea, this little thing just here, is our sister planet that would have also existed in the habitable zone from the sun, same orbit as we have. It would have been about Mars-sized, we think, though there is argument that it could have been potentially larger. We know Thea was a very dense planet, and one moving decently slowly, as a matter of fact. A high-speed impact would have obliterated both planets, and we wouldn't be here today. They imagine Thea was moving at four kilometers a second, which is enormously quick, but very, very slow in terms of planets. And it would have been a 45 degree angle of impact with the, with the baby Earth. Now, it is uh, all very well to say, OK, there was a, another planet that we've smacked into at some point, And, you know, that's why, the way we, that why we have our moon, which is the remnants of Thea. But what is the evidence for that? It's a very tall order to actually ask of people. And the more we look at our own planet and samples from the moon, the more we're actually beginning to understand how the impact happened. So we've got here the computerized model of the impact, which we'll is wait a second for it to restart. Here we go. So it would have basically vaporized itself on impact with Earth. Crucially, what we're looking at is the impact of Earth and Thea. Thea has a 45 degree of impact, so it's not a total impact straight on, but it's enough for it to glance by and obliterate itself. And the iron core of Thea, which was incredibly dense, was subsumed and basically eaten by our own core in that impact. So our planetary core made of iron has actually increased in size and increased in mass. Thea's mantle, which was denser than Earth, has actually formed two areas inside of our own mantle. And we found this through uh, seismography. So if anyone knows how people study earthquakes, basically what people can do is an earthquake forms, uh, you know, happens maybe, uh, maybe in Thailand, maybe in the Philippines, in China, anywhere on Earth. Shock waves are sent through the entire planet, and that is picked up at stations such as Hawaii. Now, Hawaii seismologists can see that the shock waves are traveling at certain speeds through the Earth's core. And as it passes through the crust, it's at one speed, through the upper mantle at a different speed, through the inner mantle another speed, then through the core and back out the other side. They can see a pattern as it travels through. There's distortion in these areas where it slows down even further due to the high density that is different to the rest of the inner mantle around it. So if I quickly go back several slides, almost the beginning. Do, 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 do. I know it's after this slide. There we go. Here we are. You can see we have the inner core and the outer core, solid and liquid, just here. The different layers of the mantle that can pass through and be registered in Hawaii. And these are the large low shear velocity provinces left of dense material from Thea's own mantle kept inside our own planet. So if I just move back a tiny bit just here. Thea's impact also explains why Earth orbits at an angle compared to every other planet in the solar system. So most of them had an impact at some point, which means they're not absolutely straight, but if you imagine a solar system with no impacts whatsoever, per laws of physics, the planets should be orbiting at a perfect angle compared to their compared to their own star. They should be orbiting at a perfect perpendicular angle. Earth has literally been smacked to the side due to this impact. So now we have our seasons. So when we're having seasons, we have regular changes that are controlled and stable every year, which life can use as minimal disturbance to evolve, but not so much disturbance that it's obliterated in one. So Thea has not only granted us a little bit more size, a little bit more mass, meaning we have a bit more gravity, enough gravity to be larger than Mars, so we keep our atmosphere. La Mars's atmosphere is actually just slowly fizzed out into space because it's not large enough to keep it contained within itself. Earth kept its atmosphere, meaning it's kept its oceans, and now we have the seasonal change for life happening just there. And so it's very lucky that we did smack into Thea at some point. We also have more evidence can taste in the moon as well. So you can, the innermost inner core 
just there, we've actually been able to very, very recently, as in February 2023 recently, find evidence of a new core slightly within and inside it. Now, you know, we can't get to the core for obvious reasons, but we can measure the radioactive isotopes coming from it in lava emissions on the surface. And they pulled uh, evidence from emissions uh, in Iceland and in Hawaii. And you would expect if a planet had had no interference with how it was born, one signature radioactive isotope, sort of like a fingerprint for that planet, as it were. Earth has two, which is further evidence of a secondary planetary core melted and combined with our own. You can also find the same isotopes on the moon, which is again evidence that it was part of a body that smacked into us. And we've sort of exchanged handshakes, as it were. We've exchanged signatures with our current planetary body. Of course, one other thing it has done, and one thing Earth is very, very grateful to have, is our magnetic field. So our magnetic field, or our magnetosphere, if you want to be very fancy about it, uh, basically protects Earth from solar radiation. It's formed essentially like an electronic current battery, so the iron cores spinning and turning inside the planet, forming electromagnetic forces that emerge from the, pole, from the uh, magnetic poles, which are not the same as the physical north and south poles, they're slightly off kilter. And it can protect against the, ultra, the radiation coming from the sun, meaning that we're not just blitzed by radiation on the surface. This is actually why most life evolved in the oceans first. The top, the top layers of the water are very good at absorbing solar radiation. Lower levels of the water are more protected just by dint of being lower down. So life and the Precambrian began in the early oceans, and the magnetic field didn't get its jolly on quite as much until about the end of the Cambrian into the Devonian period, and then life starts to slowly begin emerging on the land due to that layer of extra protection. So looking at this magnetic field, Earth has the strongest magnetic field of any rocky planet in the solar system. It is leagues stronger than Mercury and Venus and stronger than Mars as well. Uh, the moon has a very depleted iron core, and that's further evidence that we have eaten Thea's core and have sort of absorbed it into our own power within the planet. Um, the gas giants have magnetic fields as well. Jupiter's is absolutely enormous, but we don't currently have a strong theory as to how those form because it's very poorly studied at this point in time. But Earth's magnetic field is absolutely enormous. So you have two planets, one field essentially forming there, which is essential for life on Earth. I very much like walking on land. And of course, one thing that I do like to think about is immediately after the impact with the uh, um, Earth would have had rings. Earth would have had rings of debris forming around the proto-moon as it formed, and around the planet as well, much like Saturn does today. They would have been much smaller than Saturn's, given our weaker uh, gravitational output. However, Saturn is actually slowly consuming its rings, as Earth once did. The rings are not a permanent feature. Uh, Saturn's rings are only about 100,000 to 300,000 years old, and Earth would have actually reabsorbed it within a couple of million years. Uh, this year is actually the only year currently you cannot see Saturn's rings through a telescope because its angle uh, for to Earth at the moment is completely side on, so we can only see a very faint line of the rings currently. Uh, give it next year, it'll start rotating again, and we can give it, I think, about 10, 15 years. We'll have a beautiful full-on picture of the full rings of Saturn currently. But yes, I do like to imagine Earth with rings. There would have been nothing around to observe it at that point in time. It was that early on in the Hadean, but I think it would have been a beautiful thing to see at that point in time. And that is actually it for me today. That's a lot of information, so I do thank you all very much. <laughs> so.